South Hills, today I wanna to take a moment and hit the pause button. We as a society tend to run through one event to the next. There's a scripture that I wanna to read to you that's a reminder of hitting that pause button and making sure we take time to celebrate what God has done in our life. And this scripture is found in Psalms chapter 46, verse 10. It reads like this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so today what I wanna do is just celebrate what we've been able to do as a community and what we've been able to do as a church that's focused on hearing from God and allowing God to move in our lives. This year alone, we've had seven child dedications, which means families who are committing to raise their children in a godly way to make sure that they grow up knowing what God has instilled for their lives. We also have had 13 people be baptized. People who are saying, I want the world to know that my relationship with God matters and I wanna be obedient to God's word by having a fresh start and a new beginning. The other thing I wanna celebrate is this, 72 people have taken the next step by signing up for our Discover class that ultimately gives them the opportunity to hear what we believe, what we're all about, why we focus on reaching people for Christ, why we focus on taking next steps. And the one that gets me the most excited, this year alone, We've had 284 people say yes to Jesus, to trusting God and believing that Jesus is a crucial part of their life and wanting Jesus to be a part of the rest of their life. As people move into a relationship with trusting God more and more and more, that's something we wanna celebrate, such as our first time givers, people who have now stepped into trusting God with their finances. We've had 302 first time givers alone this year. People are stepping out in faith and saying, God, I trust you. I trust you more than what the economy is doing and what, more than what ultimately we're facing. And I'm gonna put my faith in you because you are in control. And the last number I wanna just take a moment to pause and celebrate is the amount of people who have filled out Connect cards. Every week when you walk into one of our campuses, one of our campus pastors or a host will stand up on stage and say, if you are ready for the next step and you would like to go further in your relationship with God, whether it would be taking a Discover class, whether it be saying yes to Jesus, whether it be signing up and saying yes to being baptized or saying yes to joining a South Hills group or serving along the local church, we've had 908 people fill out Connect cards and saying, yes, I'm ready for the next step. And we wanna make sure that before we run to the next weekend to pause Pause and celebrate what God is doing in South Hills Church through all of our church families. Next week, if you'd like to be a part of that, it's a great experience for anyone who is newer to South Hills or if you're just trying to find out who it is that we are uh, and what would it mean to be a part of a church like South Hills. That's a great thing for you to take. Um, and uh, I'm excited to be here. I had a couple days off this week. I'll share about that in just a minute. But how many of you guys have a summer vacation planned? Uh, show of hands. How many guys have like a weekend away planned? Or are you just trying to figure out like maybe a couple hours to not work? Uh, yeah. So we're talking about vacation today. We're talking about rest. Uh, we're going to be talking about time off. And I just want to say, because uh, I'm going to probably get a little bit lost in my notes here in just a minute, but I just want to say from the beginning, I'm going to use a few different words interchangeably. Um, I'm going to talk about vacation. I'm going to talk about weekends. I'm going to talk about rest. Uh, and I'm going to also talk about this word Sabbath, which you may be familiar with, but Sabbath is a term for a day where there is no, no work being done. And I'm going to use each of these terms a little bit interchangeably. So I just want to have you guys kind of track with me along that. But if I say those words, essentially we're, what we're talking about today is rest and the importance of that. For some of you, time off does not come easy 
or sit well with you. Uh, time off is a difficult thing to come by. Maybe you work in an industry or for a business that is just always busy. Uh, maybe there's just something inside of you that if you had to pick between uh, resting and working, you would just naturally pick working. Uh, there, there's a lot of different reasons, but for some of you, time off is a really difficult thing to actually come by. And then for others of you in this room, uh, you cannot imagine a scenario in which that would be true for you. You want nothing more than time off. Uh, You've been planning your next vacation and the vacation after your next vacation already. Uh, You know, the the time off, the weekends, the holidays, they're kind of the proverbial uh, carrot on a string dangling in front of you that kind of keep you just, I just need to make it until the next month, the next trip, the next time we get to get away, the next vacation that we have. Um, and some of you guys, it just happens uh, quickly. Some of you have planned these things. Uh, we actually, this week, so we had a couple days, uh, we went up to an area called Buellton, uh, right outside of Solvang, and we stayed at a campground. Uh, we did not camp. We stayed in a cabin at a campground. Uh, there was uh, all of the running water and electricity that you needed. Uh, and so, uh, but we had a great time. We went last year, and we, it was our first time there. We had an amazing time, and so when we got back, we booked it again for this year. So we've been waiting for this, really, for almost a year, um, planning for it, looking forward to it. Our kids had an incredible time, uh, and we broke our record. We didn't have to go to the emergency room at all this trip, so that's better than the first time we went. We only lost one kid, and it was just for about an hour. Uh, So overall, it was a very relaxing vacation. Um, But there's all these things, these ways that we kind of look forward to and plan out trips, time off, vacation even weekends. For some of you guys, the weekend is the only thing that keeps you going. Uh, Just got to get through these five days of work and then I get to the weekend. And and there's these things that really start to build up and hold a lot of weight for us. Of course, weekends and vacations can be absolutely relaxing and meaningful, but just in the same way that we cannot find total fulfillment in our work, we also cannot find total fulfillment in vacation or leisure. I know some of you would like to test that theory, and I understand that, Uh, but there's just this balance that's kind of baked into the reality of our life and the way that we are wired to be. All too often, our vacations can become an escape from reality. They kind of become this escape from our day-to-day obligations, and and we get so tired from work and burnt out and and exhausted, and and eventually we get to this place, and I've heard people say it to me before, I've said it before, maybe you've said it before, but you just get so tired that you're like, ugh, I just need a vacation. And all of a sudden, in that moment, your vacation becomes an escape from reality. Your vacation becomes a way to get out of the day-to-day, a way to, to move away from your work, your job, the, the way you spend your normal days. And at first glance, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But your vacation, your time off, your weekend, your Sabbath, your rest, it is not meant to be a way to fix what gets hurt when you are working. Let me just put it this way. Good time off can never fix what bad time on has broken. I want to say it just a a couple different ways. If you work in an unhealthy way, if you are obsessed with work, if you are finding it difficult to unplug, to not check your emails at night, if you have like a, you know, call me anytime, 24 hours a day type of policy, if, if you work and if you spend your time on in an unhealthy or an unrealistic way, it doesn't matter how good your vacation is. It doesn't matter how great that trip to Hawaii is or that weekend off or whatever it is, good time off will never be able to fix bad time on. We have to decide, okay, how do I work in a healthy way? How do I find a healthy approach to working so that I can actually experience vacation? Because here's what I know, is that vacations are almost never as relaxing as we want them to be. They're never quite as peaceful or beautiful. There's always some amount of sunburn and tears involved. Uh, You pull something, loading the car, you miss a flight, you get a flat. I mean, there's always something. So we kind of, we idolize this time of, okay, this is going to be the thing that solves all of this other stuff. But this thing also has its own issues. It's not actually an escape from reality. You're just not at work. It's still reality. 
And so we put all of this weight into our time off, a weekend, a day, a, a, a trip, a, a, you know, whatever it might be to, to expect that to fix it. And so I would, what I want to suggest is that we actually approach our work differently. And I think in doing that, we actually will experience more rest than ever before. Part of the important thing for us to recognize, and this will be a hard pill for some to swallow, is that work and vacation are not opposites. Work and vacation are not opposites. They actually work together. They're a partnership. Work and sleep are opposites. Uh, work and vacation are actually, they go in tandem. It's like this, this dance that was originally created by God in the beginning. In Genesis 2, it talks about how for six days God created and he took chaos and he formed goodness out of it. And then in Genesis chapter 2, it articulates that God saw all that he had done and he rested. There's this word, this idea that's baked into this first passage of Sabbath of marking out one day out of the seven to, to rest, to cease, to stop working and actually just enjoy and appreciate and celebrate the goodness of what is. And that's what we're going to be talking about in, in different forms. Uh, I don't want to get into the weeds about specific you know, Sabbath rules of whether it's a day and what day is it. or uh, this, That's not what this is about because I don't think that the majority of us are doing it good enough to have that conversation even. The majority of us aren't able to actually rest enough to really get into the weeds of a specific conversation about the Sabbath day. I want us to start to appreciate and acknowledge the, the, the reality that many of us find ourselves in. Your life needs work and it needs rest. It's a symbiotic relationship and it was modeled for us by God himself in the Genesis story. God works so we work. God rests, so we rest. Work isn't tied to sin the same way that rest isn't tied to exhaustion. But oftentimes we take time off, we, we look forward to the weekend because we're exhausted. And it's actually meant to be so much more than that. It's not meant to be an emergency room or a recovery room. The first time we actually, uh, not only does God model this, but he gives clear instruction for us to do the same, and it shows up in the Ten Commandments. The fourth out of ten is found in Exodus chapter 20, um, and this, uh, these commandments are given. God speaks to Moses, and Moses delivers these Ten Commandments to Israel. They had just been freed and escaped slavery of Egypt. And, uh, and they're going into the wilderness, and God gives them these rules. We're going to go old school today. We're spending a lot of time in the Old Testament. I know, you're excited. Uh, but I think it's really interesting, and I think it's going to be really helpful for us, because I, I think that there's some surprises here, and I think it will shift a little bit of how we perceive the way that we show up to work. But in Exodus chapter 20, Moses has gone through the first three of the commandments, and then he gets to the fourth one, and he says, remember the Sabbath day. Everybody say, remember. 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 Uh, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And actually, it's interesting, if you go look at Genesis 2, and I'm sure all of you will do this exactly when service ends, uh, the first time God ever said anything was holy was about the Sabbath day. It wasn't a temple. It wasn't a place. It was actually time, taking time. It was said, this is holy. This is where you can find me. Just a little side note, it's bonus extra credit points for you guys. So we have this first thing, uh, Moses is sharing this with the Israelites as they get out of slavery, but what a lot of people don't know is that Moses actually taught the Ten Commandments two times. They obviously talked about it a lot in their homes, but there's two different times when Moses taught the Ten Commandments. The first one is when they... Uh, fled from Egypt, and he was given the Ten Commandments. And it's all of these families and these individuals that had been in slavery for almost 400 years. They had been enslaved in Egypt. And for the first time, they find themselves on the verge of being in control of their own lives. And so God is giving them these rules for how to live, the best way to live and care for each other. The second time Moses taught the Ten Commandments was about 40 years later. 
They're on the verge of going into the promised land. This is the land that was said to be flowing with milk and honey, which is weird for us uh, because nobody drinks milk anymore. Uh, It's flowing with oat milk and honey. Um, uh, Oat milk and agave, if you will. Uh, So, But it's this land, and really what this word is for is that it's meant to be that this is a land of blessing. It's a land of enough. You will no longer have to struggle. There's this, this goodness, this home that's promised in this place. The other interesting thing about this is that all of the original generation of uh, Israel had at this point passed away. And Moses was actually just a few days away from dying himself. And so he's teaching this next generation of Israelites, the next generation of leaders who are now 30, 40 years old, the ones that didn't grow up in Egypt, but they actually grew up in the wilderness. He's teaching them the Ten Commandments as they go into this new season. And he teaches uh, this uh, fourth commandment in this way, as he's retelling it. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, he says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Everyone say, observe. Observe. Fantastic. As the Lord your God has commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, it's interesting because this word observe is different than remember. We can all agree on that. Those are two different words. And the actual Hebrew word there can be translated as observe, or sometimes it's translated as guard, which is really different than remember, guard, protect. There's like this defensive kind of aspect to it. And then at the end, the reason why they should observe or remember the Sabbath is different also. It says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt, And that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So the first time Moses taught the Ten Commandments, he said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy because God created the Sabbath. He worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. So you should participate in that. And the second time, 40 years later, with another generation of of Israelites on the verge of entering into the promised land, he says, guard or observe the Sabbath, because remember, you were slaves in Egypt, but God freed you. And so why are there different reasons given? Why is it different? Why is it being taught different ways? It's interesting, because I think in the first time, what you have is the nation of Israel had just escaped the trauma of being enslaved. They've just been liberated of 400 years of uh, enslavement in Egypt. They had just made their way through the plagues. They had just been chased down by the Egyptians. They had just barely escaped through the Red Sea. And in that place, when they finally have their freedom, God says to them, remember the Sabbath. This is how life was created to work, that you would work for six days and you would rest on the seventh. I work this way, God says to them, and I want you to do it the same. It's almost as if he's leaning in. And if you can just kind of almost close your eyes and imagine a terrified, exhausted, wounded, broken nation that has just been freed from slavery. And God is leaning in and saying, it's okay to rest now. It's the way It was meant to be. You haven't had a chance, but I want you to remember that this is what I had planned for you. Work and rest together, not opposing forces, not opposites. It's okay. Take a breath. Let your guard down. Have you guys ever been through a season of life where things seem to be going a little bit too well and you're like, well, something's going to happen. I know it. I can't imagine what it must have felt like for them to finally be free and still have that terror in the back of their mind of getting caught, trapped again, found out, discovered, chased down. God says, it's okay, children, to rest. The second time that Moses teaches us, though, it's not to those people that are just out of slavery. In fact, these people didn't grow up in slavery. He's teaching it to people that had heard stories about it, but had never personally experienced it. And it's an interesting thing because he says that he wants them to to remember that they were in slavery, to remind them that even though they didn't suffer specifically the cruelties of Pharaoh, that it's a part of their story. 
And as they're about to enter the promised land and live this privileged life, he wants them to, to, to guard, to protect, to observe the Sabbath. There's this reality that they're going to go in and have the goodness of what God has promised them. And he wants them to remember and guard this thing. It, the first time he taught it, the Sabbath was about tapping into this beauty of creation. The second time he taught it, it was about this idea of rest being an act of defiance against Pharaoh, of saying, no, remember, you are no longer slaves. You've been, you've been saved by God's mighty outstretched arm. The first time it was about a way of saying yes to God and to the way he created the world. The second time it was like a way of saying no to the system of being overworked. The first time it was an invitation to join God in celebrating the goodness of life. And the second time, it's a warning to stay away from Egypt's way of life. I think it's interesting. You have these two different times it was taught. And I love that he taught it in a different way. Same law, remember the Sabbath, but he gave them a different reason for it, depending on what they needed to hear. And I think that if Moses were standing in front of us today, I tried to grow my beard out, but I couldn't make it happen. I think if Moses had to pick one message for us in 2022, I think it would be to guard, to observe, to protect this thing. Don't fall into the trap. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, but you have been set free from that. In Egypt, Israel were slaves, and slaves don't get to rest. Slaves only have a value based on what they produce. They live to work all day and every day until they die. Rest is not an option for a slave because you have to be in control of your own life to choose to rest. Actually, in Exodus chapter 5, in one passage, I want you to look at all of these uh, statements about the work coming down from Pharaoh and from the slave drivers. This is all from Exodus chapter 5. Why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. You are stopping them from working. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I'll not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. Some of you are like, that sounds like an email I got from my boss this week. Um, the slave drivers kept pressing them saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Again, this is just one chapter, and this is just one glimpse, and we can never fully understand, but I think it's important for us to get a glimpse that there was nothing that mattered more than producing, than working, than what you were able to put out for the Pharaoh, for the kingdom that they were enslaved by. There was nothing that made a person more or less value than how much they were able to produce. Pharaoh was a relentless and cruel master. And no matter how much they produced, it was never enough. It was never enough. And I think one of the things that I've had to come to grips with as we've prepared for this series and these topics is that there is a little Pharaoh that's alive in every one of us still. We all have like this little miniature Pharaoh shouting at us, whispering to us. When I first said this, I couldn't think of anything besides a night at the museum where they have like the little miniature Roman guards. <laughs> so like that, but not as cute, uh, not with like the British accent. Um, we have this voice inside of our hearts and our minds that is still saying these types of things to us. And as much as we want to point to our boss or whoever kind of runs our schedules, there's actually so much of it that comes from our own hearts because we want to make sure that we have value. And what value do we have if we can't produce? I want to make sure I'm worth it. But if, can I be worth it if I'm not actually accomplishing things? There's this voice that sometimes whispers and sometimes is shouting to us. I know it's a difficult season, but there's no excuse to get less done. I know you have family waiting for you, but you have to provide more for them. 
I don't care that you're sick, you still have to work. I don't care that you're exhausted, you have to produce more. Work harder and faster and longer. You're only as good as what you produce, as the work you do. And I think in our desire for more and in that restless guilt that we carry, there's like this voice of Pharaoh inside each one of us that we struggle with. We feel bad when we're not working. We feel bad turning our email notifications off on our phone. We feel guilty taking time off. I've talked to people and I've asked them what they did over the weekend. And so many times people say, actually, I didn't do anything. And they kind of cringe like it was a a bad thing. Like I was unproductive. I'm sorry. And it's like, no, that, that's, not, that's not even just okay. Like, that's great. I love that for you. Because when was the last time that we didn't do anything? We're always doing something. We're always tempted to, to check in over the weekend or during a vacation. Now, especially with being able to work from home, it's like work continues and it never has this ending thing with Zoom calls and we're always reachable. These labor-saving devices like laptops and computers have actually increased the amount of time that we work instead of decreasing it. I read two different articles over the last couple of weeks that were fascinating to me. The first one was talking about how COVID killed the sick day, that there's no longer sick days because you can just still work when you're sick. You can get on Zoom and you can put your filter on so you don't look sick and you can just be a part of the meetings. And you, so it kind of killed the sick day. And, and I thought, man, that is, that's brutal. But that's, that's so true. So many of us, we don't feel like we can actually just take a day off when we're ill. Another thing that I was talking with some friends that were from the Midwest and uh, we were talking about snow days because my 11 year old thinks that there's nothing better than being able to live in a place that has snow days from school. And they were saying that COVID killed snow days. And now there are no, no snow days given anymore because they know that the kids can just do school on their computer. And not that snow days are the most important thing, but there is just this ability that we have to remove any amount of rest, any amount of break, any amount of excuse, any amount of reason of why you can't produce or do more. We have taken every aspect of that. Some of you may be feeling anxious right now. Like I could have actually gotten some work done today instead of coming to church. <laughs> you just breathe a little bit. As we think about our ability to work, even when we're on a weekend or on a trip, there's times where we'll go somewhere with our kids and, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'll do a little bit of work. Um, you know, it's, this trip is more for them. I don't know. I'm sure nobody else has ever thought that before. But as I was reading and processing through, I was really challenged by this fact of not only am I robbing something from them on that trip, but I'm also not actually being healthy as an individual, which robs them from something. And I'm being an example. I I don't want them to do that. Do any of us want our kids to work when they're on a vacation as an adult? Absolutely not. But I show them that that's what it is to be a dad or a parent or an employee. We have to fight back against this tiny voice All of this and more is why a rhythm of work and rest is so important and maybe more important than ever before. When Moses said to remember that they were slaves in Egypt, the emphasis, we get to choose where the emphasis is on these sentences, right? It says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. So is it, when I read it, I, I, I tend to read it like, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. But I don't think they would have forgotten that. I think that maybe the emphasis was in a different spot and maybe he said it more like, remember you were slaves in Egypt, meaning you are no longer slaves. In fact, God intervened and it says with his mighty outstretched arm freed you from that way of life, freed you from the control of Pharaoh, freed you from a system that was unfair and unjust and expected more of you than you as a human could ever produce. You no longer have to live that way. Remember, you were slaves and you are no longer. That is how Moses taught this command. Keep the Sabbath, take time, rest, stop, cease. It's okay. And in fact, it's the way you were wired to exist. Pharaoh is now long dead and God has freed us from that way of life. So practically speaking, 
what we need to hold on to and what we are uh, reminded by of that idea of guard this day of rest, guard a weekend, guard a vacation, time off, guard it, is that rest is no accident. Rest has to be planned and it has to be protected. It has to be intentional. I don't think I've ever accidentally rested. I dozed off a couple times. Uh, so, but uh, in general, and it's not like an accidental vacation or an accidental time where I have nothing. To, I mean, it's, it almost has to be planned out and protected. And we have got to become intentional about doing this in our own lives. Left to our own devices, we will quickly spiral into an unhealthy way of working and of viewing our work and ultimately an unhealthy way of actually being able to rest. But when we remember and when we guard and protect this time, it actually has more to do with how we spend our time working than how we spend our time off. Planning, protecting, what do we need to do to prepare for this time? <clears throat> rest is how we say enough. So there's a, a mantra that I read a few weeks ago um, and I, I want us to read it together. It's a lot of words. Uh, it's going to come up on the screen, and you'll be like, shocked. Yeah, see? I told you. You would be shocked. I want us to read this together. I want us to read this out loud, and I recognize that not everybody's eyes are as good as they used to be. Uh, so I also printed out this high-quality version of it. Uh, it says in your little uh, note packet there on your seat. I don't know if you'll be able to read that either, but you can take it with you and put it up on your mirror at home, on your computer monitor, wherever you need to put this. But I would love for us to read this out together because we need to continue to speak the truth that Moses spoke to Israel. We need to continue to say, you were slaves. You are no longer this. You are no longer marked. Your value isn't defined by what you do or what you produce. So let's read this together. Enough is enough. I do not have to work more. I don't have to buy more. I do not have to sell more. I do not have to move up in the company. I do not have to earn my father's love. I don't have anything to prove. I do not have to get a perfect score. I do not need another stamp on my passport. I do not need another bay in my garage. I do not need to be younger or more beautiful. That one hurts. Uh, I don't need to have my kids in ballet or soccer all year long. I don't need to make everybody happy. I don't need to get everything I want. There is no quota. The only slave drivers are the ones in my head. My value doesn't come from what I produce, and my joy and peace don't rise and fall with my net worth. Pharaoh is dead. Egypt is in the past. I am not a slave anymore. I'm free, and I'm part of a different kingdom now. And I honor God with how. Good job, you guys. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, it's long, but these reminders are crucial for us. It's long, but the truth that's in these words is crucial to, to continue to speak over our own hearts and our own minds when it begins to creep up that, oh, well, I've got some time. Maybe I should just check real quick or maybe I should just hop in or, you know, I don't have too much going on. I'll just work a few extra hours or, I don't know. It's not about can you work more. It's about you should rest. You should cease. You should carve out time. And again, a day, a week is a beautiful thing. A weekend is amazing. A vacation is incredible. We have to become intentional about what this looks like. And since rest is something that we have to guard and protect and plan for, what would it look like for us to be intentional about that? So I've got a few questions here. You guys can write these down or take a picture or just if you have a better memory than I do, maybe you'll be able to remember these things. The first one is find out what fuels you. Uh, what, what is it that fills you? When I get to a, wec a, a weekend, a weekend um, when I get to a weekend, uh, the thing that I want to do most 
is not what fuels me. The thing that I want to do most is lay on the sofa and watch TV. And it's nothing specifically wrong with that. But it never energizes me. It doesn't matter how much I watch. It doesn't matter how little I watch. I am just in neutral. Uh, it never energizes. But that's the thing that I go to. My years may be the same, may be different. So I have to choose what is it that fuels me. And I have found as I approach 40 years old that I'm basically like a 12-year-old all over again. And the thing that I enjoy a lot lately is riding my bike. I ride it almost every day. It is an electric bike, so I have to work very little. I never break a sweat. Uh, but I love it. I love being able to cruise around and have a good time and explore and, and just kind of be out there. It's a great thing. And so what is the thing that fuels you? And I want you guys to consider and think about that question as you go into a day off or a weekend off or a vacation. Be intentional. The second one is to pick a goal for your time off. This is less about a weekend and, and really more about a vacation. But sometimes you have to be intentional about what it is that this vacation is supposed to accomplish. I had to learn this the hard way over the last few years of being a father. Sometimes we go on a trip, and that trip is for my kids. It's not for me. And so I do a lot of work to make sure that they have an incredible time. Other times I go on a trip that's for me, or it's for my wife and I, or for our whole family. But being intentional, what is the, what's the goal for our time off? What's the goal for this trip? What do we want to get out of it? The third one is to remove work apps from your phone. Um, this is crucial. Just show of hands. I want you guys to be honest. How many of you guys have notifications on your phone turned on? Show of hands. You have no, yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Uh, no, I get it. And there's kind of an expectation that you should have notifications always turned on. But so helpful to either at least turn off the notifications or just delete those apps. Do you guys know how easy it is to install an app again on your phone? It's very simple. Uh, some of you need to delete your Slack or whatever it is that you have on your phone. You need to get that off so you're not tempted to look at it. I go on trips, I go into my settings, and I turn off my work email. There's just a toggle switch that does it. I turn off my work calendar, my work email. It's so simple. Some of you actually need to just delete Instagram when you go on a vacation or on a weekend. You'll sit there and you'll just scroll. It's like, yeah, Hawaii was great. What is everybody else doing? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy the way that we get sucked into these time-saving devices. They're so helpful and convenient, and they steal so much from us. And then the fourth one is that we need to remember that it's a discipline, and sometimes it feels that way. Sabbath rest is actually one of the spiritual disciplines, just like reading your Bible and prayer. It's a spiritual discipline. And just with all of those disciplines, sometimes it takes intentionality and effort, and we don't always feel like doing it. But it's still so good for us to build this into our lives. It does not always feel easy or perfect, but it is always healthy and good. It is the way that you are wired. God modeled this for you, and you're invited to enter into that same dance of working and resting. And do you know what I know about dancing? Most of us don't feel very good at it. <laughs> and most of us don't like other people watching us dance. We feel a little bit awkward. And you will too as you navigate this new balance of work and rest. And you have a spouse or a child sitting next to you that's going to remind you next time it's a weekend and you're on your work phone or your work computer, or you pack your laptop bag to go on your vacation, it will feel awkward, and there will be times that you get it wrong, but we need to go back to remember, you were slaves. Now you're invited to live the way that God created you to live, work and rest together. Let's pray.